Okay, we're going to uh, get going on this lecture by uh, giving you a few examples from the previous lecture of some animals that we discussed. Just remember when we talk about spiral cleavage and spirulins, we're talking about this cleavage that's a little bit off centered from embryology. And if you're confused by that, be sure to go back and check that previous lecture. And so I wanted to show you some examples of some of the different animals that we talked about by giving you little video clips of a few different animals. The first one was actually one of the last animals we talked about, which is the ribbon worm. So I wanted to show you a ribbon worm in real life. And it's just kind of funny because it's, um, as you'll see, quite nasty in its uh, appearance, at least to me. So here we have a ribbon worm and you can see it actually laying on uh, this rock near the ocean and watch it's going to shoot out its proboscis. So you can see that's pretty crazy how big that projection is from its proboscis. Its proboscis is huge. Okay, now we're going to take a quick look at examples of flatworms. We will, you can watch these videos, of course, on YouTube yourself, but I'll show you a couple examples of flatworms. We'll skip through this video a little bit. Animal was the first hunter. But scientists believe there is an animal living today that gives us a good idea of what that ancient trailblazing ancestor looked like. Notice how flat it is, of course. Is a flatworm. I believe these could be the eyes. They may be among the most obscure animals on Earth. But near the base of our family tree, a similar creature was the first to move with intent. So again, these are some of the to most primitive animals. To hunt. There's another their one. direct descendants have spread tenaciously surviving in almost every environment on land. They also have an interesting nervous system where you can see its brain and, and nervous system becomes a little bit more complex. And then inside is here's the digestive system or um, and so forth. And they also have flame cells that help in there that function as like primitive it's Kennedy's. It's so extensive, it reaches to every There's its gut. To the gut. There's another flatworm, three living. Was also the first animal with an internal system to deliver sperm to an egg. Basic internal fertilization changed the shape of life. Flatworms are hermaphroditic. They have both male and female sex organs. Okay, so that's examples of flatworms from our previous lecture. And as I've mentioned, uh, flatworms are also parasitic. Here is a liver fluke. So it's on the liver, you can see it right here. It's right here in the progress. This is it right here. See it moving now? So again, that's uh, one of the animals from our previous lecture. And now we're gonna look at a rotifera. Remember, this is the anus and, and grabbing in. The, you can see the body moving. So this is among the smallest animals. Remember, here's the cilia. 
throw it off screen. See the cilia moving? And so it takes in particles and it's going to digest it. So anyway, that gives you an idea of, of those animals. Okay, now here is um, larvae of trichinella. Now remember, these are capable of forming cysts in your muscles if you eat um, poor, um, poorly cooked pork. Now most of the pork in the United States is actually very clean and does not have much of this trichinella parasite. And don't blame pigs or anything. Almost every animal has some type of parasite and many of them can be spread to humans if they developed a close domestic relationship with them. But realize, um, particularly in our past, pork and pigs can run around eating what they wanted. Bears can run around eating what they wanted and then they can become infected with this parasite. And if you eat undercooked flesh of pigs or bears or whatever, you can get an infection of trichinella. And again, it'll, what happens is this will bury, after it goes into your intestine, it'll leave as a cyst and then it'll go through your body and then can go to your muscles or your brain or your lungs and can cause some pretty nasty um, experiences. This is actually trichinella wiggling around under a microscope. Now again, this is a nematode, and there's some there's all sorts of types of nematodes from microscopic ones that you really can't see without a microscope to some that are really, really long that would be found in the intestine of a horse, for instance, as a parasite. Now I'm going to show you lyphophorates. Um, this one is an example of bryozoa. I may call it lophorates, but it's lyphorates. It's kind of Difficult word for me to pronounce anyway. But here's a bryozoa doing its thing. You can see it kind of extends out of that chitinous too. And then again, it's going to have that U shaped digestive system. So it's going to suck food into its digestive system down here. And again, it's U shaped. And so there's little cilia helping beat water towards it. You can see some more. So anyway, I'm hoping this gives you at least a better understanding of what these animals look like by getting to see them in motion versus this the um, picture that I had shown. So here's coming out of its chitinous tube. And then here is a brachiopod. That's part of the lophorphorex. I was having a little trouble pronouncing it. But anyway, it looks a little bit like a muscle or a clam, but it actually isn't. I remember it has, it's going to have that U-shaped body plan again for digestion. So here's more of that brachiopod moving. And again, it's going to have a U-shaped body plan. All right, so at this point, we've covered sponges, jellyfish, flatworms, nematodes, rotifers, 
And we've also talked about low ferrites, which is kind of in this ambiguous area. Again, a lot of this and low ferrites. Now, a lot of this, again, is going to be determined by this, this evolutionary tree, the simplified evolutionary tree is based on their basic body anatomy. But again, like we've discussed in previous lectures, we can use molecular data looking at genes of some sort or protein of, of, of some type, get at the number of nucleotides or the number of amino acids, that's what are the building blocks of those DNA and, and proteins are made up of amino acids. We can look at that as well to get it at how closely related these animals are to each other. And we'll also build this evolutionary tree in a similar manner. So again, the idea is that everything came from ancestral protus. Our most simple animals had no tissues or no symmetry. Those were our sponges. We had radio symmetry with, sponge, with uh, um, jellyfish with only um, a couple different tissues. And then we started seeing bilateral symmetry and triple plastic tissues, triple, you know, three different tissues endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm. And we do see uh, bilateral symmetry now in our flatworms. And we found that some flatworms are free living and some are parasitic. But these are some of the simplest animals where we start to see more of a nerve network, even though we see some nerves in jellyfish. And then we started looking at body cavities and were able to put the nematodes in there and the rotifers in there which have a pseudo seal. And now we're gonna start talking about the vast majority of animals which have a true coelom, which again is gonna be body cavities with linings to them. We're gonna first talk about mollusks and then we're gonna get into segmented animals like annelids and arthropods and so forth. So mollusks are coelomates. So that means they have a true body cavity. And the complexity of the animal is actually can be quite dramatic depending on which group of this group we're talking about mollusks. Mollusks are just um, clams and things like that. This also includes octopi, squids, nautilus, animals that are very intelligent in their own way. So outside of arthropods, this is one of the more um, widespread animals as well. So the bulk of the animal kingdom consists of coelomates. If we go back to that tree that I showed you here, these are all coelomates, all these animals underneath um, this evolutionary tree. They have three primary tissues that include the ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. And coelomates, their body, the mesoderm and endoderm do have some contact. Um, one major phylum of coelomes without a segmented body include the, the mollusks. So the mollusk is a major phylum of coelomates without a segmented body. So again, if you looked at an insect or even ourselves, you'll see segments, um, but we don't see that in these um, mollusks. And we'll get into different types. But this is the second largest animal phylum after arthropods. So there's a huge amount of animal diversity in this phylum, because remember it's kingdom phylum class, order, family, genus, species, right? So the phylum of mollusks is huge and arthropods include things like spiders and, and uh, insects and so forth. So that's another big phylum. So this is the second largest of them. Their body consists of three distinct parts the head, foot, visceral mass, and mantle. 
and their gills capture oxygen from water and release carbon dioxide like we do. The radula is a rasping tongue-like organ that's used to scrape algae off of rocks. <clears throat> so mollusks, again, are from the phylum mollusca, which range in size from very small snails and slugs that you might see around your garden or campus to giant squids that can be over 18 meters long. So that's huge. Mollusks have a unique, as I mentioned before, a unique body plan. We're going to see a picture of that in a moment. The mollusk is, uh, has a large muscular structure. I kind of hit on that already. The mantle is a fold of tissue that covers the visceral mask. And the visceral mask means things like the digestive system, the lungs, um, the heart, and stuff like that. That's what we call it, mean by visceral of the internal organ. So it's kind of a protective layer. We're not actually I'm talking about the shell in this case. We're talking about a specific thick, leathery like tissue. Um, I would I haven't, I would presume it's leathery. It's definitely gonna be kind of a connective tissue that's, that's tough. Um, the gills uh, lie within the mantle cavity and the beating of the cilia creates a flow of water that helps to oxygenate them. And then of course they'll breathe out carbon dioxide just like us, but they'll take the oxygen from the water through their gills or from the air if it's very moist because we obviously snails live on land as well as slugs. So what are the different major groups of mollusks? Well, we have our gastropods, which includes snails and slugs. So those are gastropods. We have our bivalves, which includes clams, oysters, and scallops. So you're probably at least a little bit familiar with those since you could find them in a red lobster near you. And then we have cephalopods, which include octopuses and squids and nautilus actually. These tend to be the very, if we're gonna consider a very intelligent invertebrate animal, it would come from these cephalopods. And so here's one example of it. Now they have an interesting larvae called a trochophore. Um, fertilization takes place often in the water with the sperm and the eggs. And then they will make this larvae here called a trochophore. Um, the trochophore is a distinctive larva type in polychaetes, mollusks, and several other lineages with a spiral cleavage. Remember what spiral cleavage is? That's going back to our embryology where we talked about how we have the cells when they divide are a little bit offset. To I've forgotten that, it might be worthwhile to check it out again. The trochophore is believed to represent an evolutionary link between annelids, which is a worm, earthworms, and mollusks. So that suggests their evolutionary relationship because they have a larvae that is very similar, known as a trochophore. Here you can see its stomach, its mouth, its intestine and its anus. And it also has a cilia that helps it to move around. So here is our first example, the snail. And remember what it was? It is a gastropod. And so you can see that there's the shell and on top of the, right underneath the shell is the mantle. So this is all living animal right here. And then that's covering up the visceral organs, which means the heart, the lungs, or um, gills in this case. Here's its digestive system. And it's gonna have what we call an open circulatory system. So the hemolymph type blood might be flowing around it. I believe it's called hemolymph for these animals as well. But anyway, it's, um, that's what you have for it. Um, here's our radula which is our rasping tongue. It's a muscular like foot that allows it to walk around. Many mollusks 
are carnivores. That doesn't mean there are snails that obviously will feed on plants, but there are many moths that are carnivores. And I'm not just talking about snails necessarily, but there are snails that would also be carnivores, I believe. They locate their prey by using chemosensory structures within the mouth of the snail, are horny jaws and a unique rasping tongue called a radula. That's what that is. If you haven't already seen snails and, and slugs, they creep along the ground on their muscular foot. And usually they leave a little bit of a watery slime behind them, if you've seen that from slugs. So the squid shoots through the water by um, squeezing water out of the mantle. That's a squid though. So we're talking about squids in this case. Snails have a three chambered heart and an open circulatory system. That means that the, that the blood is traveling around the body without the need of veins and arteries. <clears throat> the coelom is actually pretty confined to a small cavity around the heart. So we see a lot more coelums like in our bodies than in comparison to these animals, but they do have a coelom. Mollusks are among the first animals to develop an efficient excretory system. They have what you, what we have is a primitive, uh, or they have basically a kidney-like structure called a nephridia that gathers waste from the coelom and discharges it into their mantle or into the mantle cavity, that's this area right here. So here's another generalized body plan. We got the shell, we have the mantle, we have the radula, we have the mouth, we have the stomach, gills, digestive gland, we have the heart, the foot, and here's some more gills, and the anus. There's been all sorts of examples of primitive mollusks, including monoplacophora. And they were the abundant during the Cambrian period, but aren't nearly as abundant. Today, there's only a few surviving species. They have multiple gills, muscles, and excretory structures that are repeated over the length of their body. Um, I might show you some pictures of these pretty soon or a little bit later. The Keatons are a class of polyplacophora. Placophora. Um, they have multiple gills, a segmented shell. Um, they are marine herbivores that scrape algae from rocks with their radula. Adult chitons spend most of their lives glued tightly to rock surfaces by their large foot. So here's, let's listen a little bit about chitons. Marine mollusks with eight overlapping shell plates made of aragonite. The plates provide protection from predation. Their shell is surrounded by tough flesh called the girdle. There are about 500 different species of chitons. Depending on the species, chitons can be smooth, scaly, or spiny. Most prefer to inhabit rocky areas in shallow coastal waters, but some species do occur in deep waters. They possess a large muscular foot. That structure contains tiny teeth that a chitin can That's use to scrape off food particles and bring them. So that gives you an idea of chitons. Now let's talk about bivalves. These are something that you're probably a lot more familiar with, whether you've um, seen um, clams or whatever, or watched some nature videos. But here's a big bivalve, which is hinged shell that extends over the top of their body. Um, bivalves are largely sedentary, so they tend to be in one place. They have greatly reduced heads, and so you can see the heads greatly reduced. Feeding is accomplished by bringing water in through an opening called an incurrent siphon, 
and extracting food from the water using their gills. Water and gametes exit through another opening, the X current, the siphon. So water will be brought in and taken back out. And then whatever can be digested will go down the uh, body, stomach, and mouth. So it'll come in through here, be eaten, and then out the anus, and then ex expunged, so to speak. Here's its mantle again. Here's its shell. So this is basically, you know, like oysters, scallops, clams. Here's an example of a really big marine one. So they vary dramatically in size. And as you know, some taste pretty good with butter. <laughs> We've already talked a little bit about gastropods, but here's examples of um, snails. We also have slugs and we also have sea slugs as well. You can find sea slugs on the ocean floor swimming around with a muscular foot. Here's their muscular foot, here's their mouth, the radula, here's their stomach and digestive salivary glands. And then the food gets digested and goes out the anus. Here's their gills that can, and some water can come in for breathing. So slugs are basically snails without a shell. And then we have sea slugs, which um, can be found in the ocean. So that one I think you should be a little bit more familiar with. And then we have cephalopods. And again, this is another example of an animal that you should be somewhat familiar with if you've gone, luckily, if you've been fortunate enough to go to some aquariums or watch some nature shows, this is one of those well-known animals. It can change its colors to camouflage perfectly within its environment or use its colors to communicate to other octopi. Um, if you cut off a tentacle, it'll actually often regrow. They have suckers on them. They have a beak underneath for feeding on crabs and things like that. They tend to be highly intelligent, able to solve problems. So this is an example of a really, to me, one of my favorite animals easily because of what they're able to do. So we have octopi, squid, um, Nautilus is a, kind of like an octopus with a shell. And I'll provide a little bit of this maybe in a lab, online lab homework assignment. Um, they are predators. And so they'll run around and, and find food. And then they hide in rocks and hide out from sharks and stuff, unless they're really big. And then they can take on some other things. Their mobility is amazing. They can get in all sorts of little crevices. They can forcibly eject water from their cavity, giving them kind of like a jet propulsion in the water. So again, one of my favorite animals. And now I'll, I'll probably provide some videos, examples of these on uh, your homework assignment. Some of these that you already have some idea about, I'm not gonna take the time to show you a video on during the lecture, like some of the ones that are more confusing, like the ribbon worm. I, you know, I've never even seen one of those until I watched one online. Here's our Nautilus, which is a cephalopod with a shell. And they've been around since the Cambrian, Cam, Cambrian period, Cambrian, excuse me, Cambrian period, over 600 million years ago. So they were the first large shelled animals able to move vertically in the ocean. Nautiloids are cephalopods with an external chamber shell that survive even to this day. So I think this is a good um, stopping point for this particular letter uh, lecture. We talked about mollusks and we kind of hit on some of these examples from the previous lecture um, that um, give you some you know, visuals that maybe you might not have expected. We will start getting into animals that we're much more familiar with as we continue 
talking about coelomates, which also include ourselves soon.